the words. Adonai's words. From the prophet. Isaiah. From the prophet Isaiah right. Thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not. Come now. I want to hear you sing it. I want to hear your pretty voice. Come. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are mine. That's right. not seen that that is from the chosen that's their first episode called mary magdalene i think um best rendition of the life of jesus it's a free streaming series that you can get on your phone or your tablet and then shoot it to your tv if you have a roku or a fire stick but the purpose of that is because we see this weaving of mary magdalene which is a life of fear and bondage weave together with the book of Isaiah. Fear is something it seems like this world deals with. Fear of failure, fear of loss, fear of not measuring up, fear of disease, the fear of being alone, the fear of not being loved, the fear of not breaking a bad habit. The nation of Israel, for them, fear and rebellion seem to go hand in hand. They they seem to be in this cycle of sin, and it goes like this. God has a good and loving plan, and they know it. But they deviate from God's plan, and they go their own way. They find themselves in bondage. They cry out for help. They repent, and they ask for forgiveness. God is merciful and loving and forgives them and restores them and puts them on a new path. But after some time, the people go their own way again, and the cycle starts over and over and over until the voice of reason shows up. And his name is Isaiah with Adonai's words. I want you to turn, if you're quick with your book, your Bible, you can go to 2 Kings chapter 16 and then go to Isaiah 43. I'm going to read Isaiah 43 first. So 2 Kings 16 and then Isaiah 43. 
So, here we go. This is Isaiah 43, verse 1. And if you get a chance, read, read verse chapter 42, 43, and 44 this afternoon or this, this week, okay? Isaiah 43, verse 1, but now, this is what the Lord says, he who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have summoned you by name, you are mine. Isaiah is considered probably one of the greatest of the prophets in the Old Testament. In fact, his book is quoted more than 60 times in the New Testament. He's living during a time period. It's around 740 B.C. The people are going crazy. They're living with no, no moral boundaries whatsoever. Does that sound a little familiar? The people are in rebellion. They're going their own way. They're making alliances with nations that God says to stay away from. And his message really is twofold. One, if you continue to go your own way, this is what's going to happen. But two, Isaiah is also saying in the midst of that, God loves you and he's for you. Turn, I want you to turn back to 2 Kings because the passage we're reading parallels actually Isaiah Chapter 7, I believe. Isaiah is coming to one of the kings and he's talking to him about what's going on and some of the decisions that he's making. So, 2 Kings chapter 16. Stay with me, okay? Stay with me. Some of you are looking sleepy. All right. In the 17th year of Pekah, son of Ramalia, Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. See right there, I lost some of you. Stay with me. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his father, or you could say ancestor, really, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, and he even sacrificed his son in the fire. Following the detestable ways of the nations the Lord had driven out before Israel, he offered sacrifice and burnt incense in the high places on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. Then Rezin, king of Aram, Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem and besieged King Ahaz, but they could not overpower him. At that time, Rezin, king of Aram, recovered Elith for Aram by driving the men of Judah. Edomites then moved into Elith and have lived there to this day. And here's the point right here, verse 7. Ahaz then sent messengers to say to tiglath Pilasar, king of Assyria, I am your servant vassal. Come and save me out of the hand of the king of Aram and the king of Israel who attacked me. Come and save me. Now, at this time, the kingdom of Israel has divided into two kingdoms. Okay? So just imagine like the United States during the Civil War. You have your north, you have your south. Israel was like that. They had the north part. They called Israel and the southern part now, they're calling themselves Judah. Here's the problem. The northern part, Israel, had allied with another kingdom, Aram, and they are fighting Judah. Judah, their king Ahaz, says, I need help. So he calls out to the king of Assyria. Now, at this time, the king of Assyria, Assyria was like the world power. And you're thinking to yourself, well, what's the big deal? I mean, they're being attacked, right? He needs help. The problem is, one, God spoke through the prophet, don't do it. Don't go down this road. And the second thing was, Assyria was a bunch of terrorists. Do you think that's a good idea? Get, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of glimpse of what Assyria was like. So, Assyria would come in and they had a threefold war plan. Okay? The first one was they had these great war machines. Now, history has always had some sort of war machine, but Assyria took it to the next level. You know what I'm saying? When you say, like, on steroids, right? 
That's what we're talking about, like whole new level. So they would build these gigantic war machines that would just knock and annihilate these walls, doors, frames. But here's the second part. The second part was they would send a crew of, of engineers, civil engineers, and here's why. They would determine how much earth was needed to build gigantic earth ramps. Why? Because in this time period, a lot of kingdoms, especially in the capitals, their walls were, you know, they weren't, you know our walls are like this thick. No, their walls are so thick, people could live inside of them and have houses. But as it went up, it tapered. So they would figure out what it would take and build these earthen ramps. So as the earthen ramp goes up and it tapers up, they could take these huge war machines and annihilate the wall. But here's the third part of their plan. They would have people digging under the walls so it would collapse from above. One way or another, Assyria was going to get into your town. But that was just the beginning because as they came in and they killed and they annihilated and they pillaged, they had another plan, and that was to rule and to win by terror. And here's how they did it. They would take the people and they would um, impale them and put them up on poles. Then they would take the men, typically they would take all the men, and they would decapitate them and stack the heads outside the city. And here's a third one, and I don't like to say it, but this is just a fact of history. Then they would take some of the captives, and they would skin them alive. You see, their plan was not just to win, but to win to such an extent there was like a psychological warfare so that the next town they went to, the people would give up before they even got there. This... This is the kingdom that Ahaz is asking for help, and the prophet is saying, don't do it. Trust God. He's got a plan for you, even though we already read what some of the things that King Ahaz is doing. I got a short little illustration, and I'll make a point, plus it goes perfect because I'm talking about Texas on the mission trip. So there was a man. His name was Jose Rivera. Okay, nobody has heard this story. Good. Jose Rivera was a bandit from Mexico. And he was leaving quite a trail behind him as he would go along the border of Texas. And he was just like robbing, robbing bank after bank after bank after bank. Finally, it got to such a point, the banks, uh, the banks had been robbed more than once. They got together. We can't do this anymore. I mean, he, this Jose Rivera is just wiping us clean. So they pooled their money together, and they went and found themselves the biggest, the baddest Texas sheriff they could find. And they go to him, and he's like this huge man with girth and the cowboy hat and the guns on his side and a toothpick sticking out. And he had gotten word that Jose Rivera was in some little small town in Mexico. I'm not sure where that was. And he went down and talking to some of the locals, and the locals said, yeah, we, we've seen him around. He's been at that saloon, and he arrives at the saloon, and he's just outside. And the sun is setting, and you can see his silhouette, and he kicks open the door. Can you picture it? Can you hear it? There he is. That's right. The sheriff has come to town. And everybody's looking, what's going on? And he's just walking real slowly. Everybody knows this guy means business. And he goes up to the guy on the counter cleaning the, the glasses. And he says, I'm looking for Jose Rivera. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, Joe, turn it off. All right. He likes that. All right, so the guy's cleaning his glasses, you know, whatever is cleaning, and he says, I'm looking for Jose Rivera. And the guy behind the counter says, nah, and points kind of over there. So the sheriff turns around, and he goes over to this man sink, sitting over on the bar stool over there, and he says, are you Jose Rivera? Jose Rivera looks up at him as, like, shrugs his shoulder like, I understand my name, but I have no idea what you're talking about or what you're saying because I don't speak English. 
Sheriff picks up on that, and he walks over to the guy behind the counter. He says, listen, I need you to interpret for me over here. And the guy says, look, I don't want any trouble here. I'm just, and he goes, if you listen to me, there's not going to be any trouble. Finally, he says, okay. And he puts his glass down, and he walks over. He says, tell him what I'm saying. He says, okay. He goes, are you Jose Rivera? Interpreter looks at Jose Rivera. He says, are you Jose Rivera? Jose Rivera says, yes, so what? So he looks over at the sheriff. He says, Jose says, yes, so what? And this goes on back and forth for a while. Finally, the sheriff says, I want you to tell him this. Tell him I've been sent here to arrest him. But if he gives me the money, I'll take the money, I'll leave him alone, I'll tell the banks I couldn't find him, and we'll be done with that. But if he doesn't give me the money, I'm going to shoot you right here, right now. Interpreter's eyes kind of get big, and he goes, okay. So he took, comes over to ho- the other guy, Jose Rivera, and he says, okay. The sheriff says he's been sent here to arrest you. But if you have the money and you give him the money, everything will be fine. You can go on your way, and he'll go on his way, and he'll tell the banks he couldn't find you. You'll be fine. But if you don't, he's going to shoot you right here, right now. Well, Jose Rivera sits in silence for a while, finally realizing there's not really much he could do. He says, okay, you tell him this. Tell him if he goes out these doors and he takes a right and he rides his horse for about a mile, he's going to come to a place where there's a well. Next to that well on the left-hand side, there's going to be a big cement slab. If he's able to pick up that cement slab and move it to the side, there'll be a hole. Inside that hole, there's going to be money bags. Inside the money bags is money. He says, you got that? Out the doors, take a right, one mile, well, slab, hole, bags, money, are we good? Then he stands up. Well, this makes the sheriff's nervous, and the sheriff's pointing his gun, and he says, what did he say? What did he say? And the interpreter looks at Jose Rivera and looks at the sheriff, looks at Jose Rivera, looks at the sheriff, and he says, Jose says, shoot him. <laughs> you see, we are kind of like Jose Rivera in that we want to do what we want to do, regardless of who it hurts. And that's exactly what's going on with King Ahaz as Isaiah comes to him. He's saying, listen, don't go down this road. But King Ahaz is only concerned about one person, and that is King Ahaz. Isaiah, he had a difficult road in front of him, didn't he? A difficult task. It wasn't that he just had a message to proclaim. It was that he had a message to proclaim that the audience didn't want to hear. They didn't want to hear that what they were doing was against God, wasn't what he wanted. In fact, they wanted to banish Isaiah. They don't want to hear it anymore. What if... What if God gave you to give that message? How would you feel? You know, about, um, well, about 20 years ago, for for most of us here, we remember 9-11. We were there. We know where we were, what we saw on TV. I wonder, uh, when Billy Graham was alive, he was considered the kind of like the country or the national pastor, right? The pastor for the nation. What do you think would have happened if the next day God came to him and said, Billy, I want you to go on national TV the day after this happened, why it's still raw, and tell people this happened because they have forgotten God. What do you think would have happened to Billy? I can tell you what would happen if he did it today. His Twitter feed would disappear, his Facebook account would be closed, and all his speaking engagements would be canceled. Because that's what we do if we don't agree with somebody's message. And here is the message that God has given Isaiah to the king and to the nation. And Isaiah had to be just shaking his head like, I don't understand. Why? Why are the people doing this? Why are they going down their own road? You know, we ask that same question today, why? You know, a few years ago, Orange County 
California was in the news. Do you know what's located in Orange County? Disneyland. It's considered the fantasy capital of the country. Well, a few years ago, they woke up from their fantasy. When six young men were in the u news, one 18-year-old, three 17-year-olds, and two 16-year-olds, they called it the, um, the honor roll crime. Apparently, and these were uh, brilliant young men. They were all in high school. Some of them were star athletes. I know one was, of, I think, a valedictorian. A couple of them had already been accepted into Princeton University. Uh, but they had uh, a thriving business. They were computer hackers, and people were paying them to change their grades. And the bigger their business got, the more complicated it got, and so they needed more sophisticated parts. So they had decided to go and rob a computer store. Only they were worried that one of them, Ty, Stuart, Stuart Ty, was getting cold feet and might squeal to the police. So on New Year's Eve, they had called their friend and they told them, we're going to a New Year's party. Why don't you come and meet us? And they went to one of the houses where the parents were gone. And, and they had a plan. Um, when, when Ty came to the house, they had a box and they wanted him to look inside the box. And they called him over to look inside the box. And then what he didn't know was that they had, they had planted all over the place baseball bats and sledgehammers and they absolutely pulverized him to death but why his body was still lying on the ground twitching one of them just was not sure if he was still dead and so he opened up his mouth poured rubbing alcohol and then duct taped his mouth and his nose and he died from his own vomit Then they go to drag him to a grave that was already dug, cover it up with leaves. And like nothing ever happened, they took his wallet, spread the money around, and went to the party they were planning on going to. You know, it only took about 24 hours for the cops to figure out what had happened and to arrest them. One of the young men wrote a letter to his teacher and in the end of the letter this is what he said he said I do not understand and I don't exactly know what happened but I am still left with the question why what I'm trying to tell you is that we often make choices that leave us wondering why did I do it why did I go down this road? Why did I start this bad habit? Why did I get into this relationship? Why didn't I say no? Why did I say yes? And here is the prophet, and he's trying to speak truth to a people that are going down the wrong path. And I want to I wanna paraphrase just a, a few of these chapters for you, starting with chapter 17 and kind of going backwards. But here's what I understand is here we are 2,300 years later. Man is still the same. We are a broken people in need of a Savior. Listen to this, chapter 17. You have forgotten God. You have not remembered the rock of your fortress. Chapter 13. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. The time is at hand. Chapter 10. Woe to those who make unjust laws, who make widows their prey and rob the fatherless. Chapter 9. Why do you never learn? You say with pride, though the bricks have fallen and the trees are cut down, we will rebuild. We don't need God anymore. Chapter 5. I have done everything necessary for my vineyard to produce fruit but it has only yielded bad fruit. 
So I will remove myself and leave it to its own devices. You can be sure of this. When fruit bearing fails, foul growth will always follow. For they no longer have regard for my deeds and now call evil good and good evil. Chapter 3. All the great men are gone. The young will rise up. They will rule with evil. Even women will defy God, parading their sin. They do not even hide it anymore. Chapter 2. God's people have abandoned the responsibility of being light to the world and have trusted and even worshipped the things that they have made. And as Isaiah is sent to a king in a nation, while they're still in rebellion and rejecting him, here is the message. I want to paraphrase chapter 1 because it's kind of at the heart of all this. He says this, you've been brought up by a loving father, but you have rebelled, persisting in your sin. You're in pain. Your hands are full of blood. You are screaming. You are trapped. You feel like you're unable to break free. But know this, I love you, and I'm coming to set you free. That is the message Isaiah had. I'm going to close with this. Francis Thompson, probably nobody here knows. But you either know his poem or you know the name of the poem. And it's called The Hound of Heaven. Do you know that G.K. Chesterton... J.R. Tolkien and even Oscar Wilde once said of Francis Thompson, if only I could write like that. Francis Thompson was a drug addict and lived on the streets, ate garbage, and chose that lifestyle. And he ran and he ran and he ran from the love of God until one day he was gloriously transformed as he surrendered his life to Jesus. And in that surrender, he pens this poem, The Hound of Heaven. And it goes like this. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years and I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind in the midst of tears. I hid from him, and under the running laughter, up visited hopes I sped and I shot precipitated, down titanic glooms of chasm fears from those strong feet that followed after. And as Thompson begins to unfold this idea of how he ran in the midst of tears, but the tender feet of God was following him with love and pursuing him, even though he was rejecting God, the long poem ends with these words, Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou hast seekest, for thou dravest love from thee who dravest me. Dravest is to drive or to propel forward. And what he's saying is Jesus gave his very self, his love, so that he could live. Here is Thompson, given the story of his life, a man who had everything. He had a loving family, a gifted mind, the opportunity for education at the highest level, and yet he found himself on the streets, eating filth, hooked on drugs, and running from God until he heard those words. O oh, he who created you, O oh, Jacob, he who formed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Would you stand? You know, it's, it's really easy to be resistant to the tender hands of the potter. Maybe God is trying to shape your life in some way. Here is my question for you this morning. Are you running from him?
You know, 2,700 years ago, the people had run after other things and forgotten God. This was the world Isaiah was sent to. People living in such a way that left you asking yourself, why? And yet God was calling out to them, reminding them that he loves them. Not much has changed, has it? I don't know where you are. I don't know what you have done. Or why you are running. But God is coming to set you free. I want to close with these words. This is from Isaiah 42. This is what God the Lord says. The one who created the heavens and stretched them out. Who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it. Who gives breath to his people and life to those who will walk in my ways. I, the Lord, have called you, and I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open the eyes of the blind, to free captives from prison, to release from the dungeon, dungeon those who are in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. The one who made you is calling out. I hear you. And I'm coming for you. Because you are mine. Lord, what I know is we can run all we want. But you are not going to give up on us. I don't even know why we run. Why would we want to run from the person who would give up everything for us? I don't know. But praise you that you that you call us by name. That you seek us out. That the tender feet of the Holy Spirit are on is on our trail. Until the day we're just too tired to run anymore. And when we stop, you wrap your arms around us. And a loving embrace the way a father can whisper into his child's ear, you are mine. I've got you. Lord, my prayer this morning is that each one would come to that place of just surrendering it all to you. Because the plan you have is good and loving. You've got plans for a hope and a future. It may not be exactly how we had planned it or dreamed of it, but oh, it is so much better. We give you us. Lord, may you have your way with your church and your people that we may be a light to the Gentiles that we go into the dungeons and help set the captives free. Lord, I'm praying and thanking you in advance for what you're going to do in your people and in your church. 
Amen.